has disappeared. In like manner, if, in regard to our empirical idea of an object in general, whether corporeal or incorporeal, we withdraw all properties known to us from experience, we shall still be unable to withdraw from it those by which we think it as substance, or as attributive to substance, though this notion of substance has more determination in it than that of an object in general. We must therefore, overborne by the necessity with which said notion forces itself upon us, admit that it has its seat a priori in our faculties of cognition. Above quotes from Critique of Pure Reason, 2nd edition, 1787, Introduction, Part 2. Here Kant explains the notion of time according to his philosophy. Time has no objective reality. It is not an accident, not a substance, and not a relation. It is a purely subjective condition, necessary because of the nature of the human mind, which coordinates all our sensibilities by a certain law, and is a pure intuition. We coordinate substances and accidents alike according to simultaneity and succession only through the concept of time. Collected Works, Volume 2 here Kant differentiates between different kinds of happiness. This comes from his essay on the beautiful and the sublime. Because someone is only happy in so far as he gratifies a desire, the feeling that causes him to enjoy such great pleasures without him needing great ability in order to do so is certainly no trivial matter. Fat people, whose favorite artists are their cooks, and whose masterpieces lie in their cellar, enjoy their common obscenities and vulgar witticisms just as much as nobler souls enjoy their more refined pursuits. An indolent fellow who loves to have books read aloud to him because he enjoys falling asleep in this fashion. The businessman who considers all pleasure a distraction, apart from working out his profits on a smart business deal— someone who loves the opposite sex for the sheer pleasure of it and nothing else, the keen hunter, whether he merely hunts flies like the Roman emperor Domitian, or ferocious beasts like A. All these have feelings which make them capable of experiencing pleasure in their own way, without them being envious of others, or even being capable of conceiving of other pleasures. This kind of feeling, which can take place without any thought at all, I shall completely disregard." A fine feeling, which I shall now consider, is for the most part of two kinds, the feeling of the sublime and that of the beautiful. Each gives us pleasure, but in different ways. The sight of a snow-capped mountain peak rising above the clouds, the description of a wild storm, or Milton's depiction of the kingdom of hell, each of these gives us joy, but mingled with terror. On the other hand, the sight of flower-covered meadows, valleys with winding streams and grazing flocks, the description of Elysium, or Homer's depiction of the girdle of Venus, these also give us a pleasant sensation, but one that is joyful and happy. In order to feel the former sensation, we must have a feeling of the sublime. But in order to experience the latter properly, we must have a feeling of the beautiful. On the Beautiful and the Sublime, Section 1 A rare example of Kantian poetry. This was written in 1782 on the occasion of the death of Pastor Lilienthal, who had married Kant's parents. Was auf das Leben folgt, deckt tiefer Finsternis. Was uns zu tun gebot, des sind wis nur gewiss. What comes after life is hidden in deep darkness. What we are expected to do that alone we know. An even rarer example, this time of Kantian humour, a somewhat desiccated and elusive quality. This comes from the opening of his essay, Perpetual Peace. Perpetual Peace. Whether this satirical inscription on a Dutch innkeeper's sign, upon which a churchyard was painted, has for its object mankind in general, or in particular the governors of states who are insatiable of war, or whether it points merely towards those philosophers who indulge the sweet dream of a perpetual peace, it is impossible to decide. The following goes a long way toward explaining the popularity of Kant's geography lectures with the citizens of Königsberg. It was written by Dr. J. H. Stirling, a nineteenth-century British member of the Philosophical Society of Berlin. In Kant's geography lectures, he cannot help referring to some of the most interesting facts that have reached him. 
Negroes are born white, all to a ring around the navel. The ibis dies the moment it quits Egypt. The lion is so noble he will not put a paw upon a woman. If you make a cup of the rhinoceros's horn, any poison will splinter it. There is a muscle in Italy that gives out so much light that you can read by it. In Languedoc there is a hot spring that hatches eggs. Wild beasts eat only Negroes in Cambia and leave Europeans alone. The Negroes in America are immensely fond of dogs' flesh, and all the dogs bark at them. According to Dr. Sterling, these views were all gravely propounded. Chronology of Kant's Life April the 22nd, 1724. Immanuel Kant born in Königsberg in East Prussia. 1737. Kant's mother dies. 1741. Kant enters the University of Königsberg. 1746. Kant's father dies, and he is forced to leave the university to support himself as a private tutor. 1755. He finally takes his degree at the University of Königsberg. 1755. Becomes privat docent, equivalent of junior lecturer, at the university, and delivers lectures on mathematics, philosophy, anthropology, and physical geography. 1770. Appointed professor of logic and metaphysics. 1781. Publishes Critique of Pure Reason. 1788. Publishes Critique of Practical Reason. 1790. Publishes Critique of Judgment. October 1803. Falls ill for the first time in his life. February 12, 1804. Dies and is buried in Königsberg Cathedral. Chronology of Kant's Era. 1739. The Scottish philosopher David Hume publishes A Treatise of Human Nature. 1743. Birth of Thomas Jefferson. 1750-1752. Voltaire takes up residence at the court of Frederick II of Prussia in Potsdam. 1751. Death of French philosopher La Mettrie. 1759. Founding of British Museum. 1762. Rousseau publishes Émile, which causes Kant to break his routine and miss his afternoon walk. 1770. Birth of Hegel. 1774. Goethe publishes The Sorrows of Young Werther. 1776. American Declaration of Independence. Death of Hume. 1778. Death of Rousseau. 1789. French Revolution. George Washington becomes first president of the United States. 1799. Napoleon becomes first consul of France. 1804. Napoleon becomes ruler of Germany. Chronology of significant philosophical dates. 6th century BC. The beginning of Western philosophy with Thales of Miletus. End of the 6th century BC, death of Pythagoras. 399 BC, Socrates sentenced to death in Athens. Circa 387 BC, Plato founds the academy in Athens, the first university. 335 BC, Aristotle founds the Lyceum in Athens, a rival school to the academy. 324 AD. Emperor Constantine moves capital of Roman Empire to Byzantium. 400 A.D. St. Augustine writes his Confessions, philosophy absorbed into Christian theology. 410 A.D. Sack of Rome by Visigoths heralds opening of Dark Ages. 529 A.D. Closure of Academy in Athens by Emperor Justinian marks end of Hellenic thought. Mid-13th century. Thomas Aquinas writes his commentaries on Aristotle, Era of Scholasticism. 1453. Fall of Byzantium to Turks, End of Byzantine Empire. 1492. Columbus reaches America, Renaissance in Florence and revival of interest in Greek learning. 1543. Copernicus publishes On the Revolution of the Celestial Orbs, proving mathematically that the Earth revolves around the Sun. 1633. 
Galileo forced by church to recant heliocentric theory of the universe. 1641. Descartes publishes his Meditations, the start of modern philosophy. 1677. Death of Spinoza allows publication of his Ethics. 1687. Newton publishes Principia, introducing concept of gravity. 1689. Locke publishes Essay Concerning Human Understanding, start of empiricism. 1710. Berkeley publishes Principles of Human Knowledge, advancing empiricism to new extremes. 1716. Death of Leibniz. 1739 to 1740, Hume publishes Treatises of Human Nature, taking empiricism to its logical limits. 1781, Kant, awakened from his dogmatic slumbers by Hume, publishes Critique of Pure Reason. Great era of German metaphysics begins. 1807, Hegel publishes The Phenomenology of Mind, high point of German metaphysics. 1818, Schopenhauer publishes *The World as Will and Representation*, introducing Indian philosophy into German metaphysics. 1889, Nietzsche, having declared God is dead, succumbs to madness in Turin. 1921, Wittgenstein publishes *Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus*, claiming the final solution to the problems of philosophy. 1920s, Vienna Circle propounds logical positivism. 1927, Heidegger publishes *Being and Time*, heralding split between analytical and continental philosophy. 1943, Sartre publishes *Being and Nothingness*, advancing Heidegger's thought and instigating existentialism. 1953. Posthumous publication of Wittgenstein's Philosophical Investigations, High Era of Linguistic Analysis. This concludes the reading of Kant in ninety minutes by Paul Strathern. The book was read by Robert Whitfield. For other audio books from the Philosophers in Ninety Minutes series, Or if you would like to obtain a complete printed catalogue of our titles or our monthly update, telling you about new releases and our new collection of books on CD, write to Blackstone Audio Books, PO Box 969, Ashland, Oregon 97520, or call 1-800 Say Book. That's 1-800-729-2665. You may also obtain the same information from our award-winning website. Our address, all one word, is www. BlackstoneAudio.com. Thank you. Forces itself upon us. Admit that it has its seat a priori in our faculties of cognition. Above quotes from Critique of Pure Reason, Second Edition, seventeen eighty seven, Introduction, Part Two. Here Kant explains the notion of time according to his philosophy. Time has no objective reality. It is not an accident. Not a substance, and not a relation. It is a purely subjective has disappeared. In like manner, if, in regard to our empirical idea of an object in general, whether corporeal or incorporeal, we withdraw all properties known to us from experience, we shall still be unable to withdraw from it those by which we think it as substance or as attributive to substance, though this notion of substance has more determination in it than that of an object in general. We must therefore, overborne by the necessity with which said notion read aloud to him, because he enjoys falling asleep in this fashion, the business man who considers all pleasure a distraction apart from working out his profits on a smart business deal, someone who loves the opposite sex for the sheer pleasure of it and nothing else, the keen hunter, whether he merely hunts flies like the Roman emperor Domitian or ferocious beasts like A. All these have feelings which make them capable of experiencing pleasure in condition, necessary because of the nature of the human mind, which coordinates all our sensibilities by a certain law and is a pure intuition. We coordinate substances and accidents alike according to simultaneity and succession only through the concept of time. Collected Works, Volume Two. 
Here Kant differentiates between different kinds of happiness. This comes from his essay on the beautiful and the sublime. Because someone is only happy in so far as he gratifies a desire, the feeling that causes him to enjoy such great pleasures without him needing great ability in order to do so is certainly no trivial matter. Fat people, whose favorite artists are their cooks and whose masterpieces lie in their cellar, enjoy their common obscenities and vulgar witticisms just as much as nobler souls enjoy their more refined pursuits. An indolent fellow who loves to have books 